uh, so welcome um, to uh, to the parallel session number three in competition on and between platforms. Uh, so so uh, uh, Yossi Spiegel is going to is going to introduce the session. Uh, I don't think I have I have much to to say about Yossi. He, he's a super well known economist. Uh, Professor at the College School of Management at Tel Aviv University. Uh, so, so Yossi, you have you have 15 minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thanks. So let me share my screen. Uh, can you see it? Okay, so. Uh, so uh, this session is, uh, is about uh, platform competition on platforms and between platforms. And it has uh, six papers that uh, deal with uh, issues uh, from ranging from pricing to platform design to uh, platform management, uh, two empirical, uh, four uh, theoretical. Uh, what I found interesting is that I, I, I went and checked today uh, what was done on the first conference uh, that was held in 2001. And so you can see that uh, at the time uh, there was another pricing issue, but I guess uh, it's all gone now because uh, we don't speak much about internet connections and uh, often on uh, net, net pricing. Uh, but uh, interestingly, still uh, people are worried about obf obfuscation, which is something that we are going to uh, hear today as well. And this is the classic paper in, of Caillot and Julien about uh, two-sided uh, markets and, and pricing in this. And what is interesting is that uh, at the time uh, in 2001, uh, the Microsoft case was still, uh, was still uh, drawing a lot of attention and research. And I guess that uh, soon we are going to all uh, talk about the Google case and the Facebook case and uh, all of these other antitrust cases. So let me give you a, a short preview of the papers because the presentations are very, uh, uh, very short. So, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, my, my, uh, my take on, uh, on what the papers are doing. And then obviously uh, there are lots of details uh, to be filled in by the authors. So uh, the paper by, uh, by Doshin and uh, Patrick uh, deals with uh, platform pricing. And the question that they, are, they, 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 that they tackle is uh, why is it that uh, lots of platforms are charging high commission rates uh, so people complain a lot about the fact that you have to pay Amazon, uh, uh, you know, up to 30% commissions and then up the, on app stores, 30% and, and, and hotels complain bitterly about the prices that they have to pay booking.com and restaurants complain about the prices that they pay to Walt. And, uh, maybe there was, there is going to be some antitrust, uh, intervention. And the question is, why are these uh, rates so high and what are the welfare consequences? And the main insight uh, that the paper brings about is that uh, somehow competition doesn't work because uh, competing platforms have an incentive to charge very high ad valorem uh, rates, uh, you know, revenue shares. Uh, and those uh, lead to fewer apps and lower welfare. So they are, so are they, are, they harm welfare. Um, and I guess the, the main insight is that the platforms do not internalize the negative effect of the, of, 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 on the apps of having such high rates. And, uh, and this is due to multi-homing. And I guess uh, one thing to notice uh, during the presentation is, uh, I mean, the key issue here is why exactly a platform does not internalize the negative effect of the, of the high fees on the supply of apps. Uh, the second paper that uh, of, uh, of uh, Ron Berman and uh, Yuval Heller is about pricing, not so much about platforms, but uh, still it's about pricing. And the question that they ask is uh, why firms often underestimate demand elasticities, but overestimate advertising elasticities. And the main insight is that uh, this suboptimal behavior confers strategic advantage on firms vis-a-vis -vis rivals. 
And so, uh, you know, given that the conference is in Toulouse, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's worthwhile noting that uh, firms underestimate demand elasticities to become puppy dogs, uh, you know, set high prices and induce rivals to do the same, but they overestimated advertising elasticities to become top dogs and, 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 and uh, gain strategic advantage via rivals that become softer. And I guess uh, one qu common question that uh, to keep in mind is uh, how exactly the paper, uh, what are the implications of the paper for platforms? One thing to, to keep in mind is that platforms often uh, provide sellers with detailed information about sales because uh, they collect all of this data and they can provide it to sellers. So uh, in this sense, uh, you know, if, uh, if firms uh, wish to uh, be, uh, be uh, uninformed about demand elasticities, uh, then uh, and then this leads to high prices. High prices lead to low volume of sales. Uh, platforms like to have high volume because they they get uh, commissions and maybe they wish to provide this information. And I guess another question to keep in mind is that uh, if you compete against a very sophisticated uh, rival, say you sell on Amazon uh, Marketplace, but you also uh, compete with Amazon. Amazon knows a lot; it's very informed. So you know, maybe uh, this tactic wouldn't work, but you know, this is something to keep in mind. Um, the third paper by Johannen and uh, Shomogi uh, deals with platform design. Here, the question is uh, not about pricing per se, but rather uh, how much information should platform provide buyers about sellers' fees, uh, or you know, does it help uh, a platform to shroud some of the fees? because uh, those are common and you know, the question is, why is that? So the key insight is that uh, shrouding seller's fees may attract naive buyers to the platform. And therefore, uh, once you have more buyers on the platform, it's uh, easier to attract sellers and therefore uh, you can raise seller fees. And this is where the, where the benefit comes from. And I guess uh, one thing to notice when you hear about the paper, is uh, to, uh, to understand exactly why shrouding uh, fees uh, affects the number of consumers because this works in the paper in a subtle way. And I guess the exact mechanism is uh, interesting to, uh, to, to notice because this is the key to, to the, the result here. Uh, the fourth paper by uh, Bacchus, Blake, uh, Petus and Tadelis uh, asks the question, uh, is it a good idea for a platform that connects buyers and sellers to allow them to exchange messages? Um, and obviously this is a design feature because you can open a, a, a messenger and allow buyers and sellers to communicate. And uh, the main result here, the main insight is that uh, this was actually done on eBay in Germany and allowing buyers and sellers to communicate uh, increase the likelihood of successful bargaining by 14%. This is quite substantial, showing that communication helps. But uh, another insight from the paper is that, uh, you know, just allowing people to communicate doesn't help uh, immediately. People have to learn how to communicate effectively. Only once they learn, uh, the benefits uh, kick in. Uh, and one thing, I guess, to notice about the paper and to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, what exactly communication does? Why exactly does it facilitate the bargaining and, and which type of messages uh, can, can help you to complete negotiations uh, effectively? Um, the next paper by Frank uh, Schluter uh, looks at uh, platforms uh, most favored uh, nations clauses which essentially say that uh, you, cannot charge, uh, you cannot charge a lower price on, on your direct channel uh, than the price that you set on, 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 on platforms. And uh, this was, I mean, this was a big debate say, in Germany where, 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 where uh, platforms were not allowed to impose MFNs. MFNs like to impose uh, those MFNs because uh, they say that uh, the problem is that uh, you know, they provide uh, a lot of information to prospective uh, customers. 
customers check the website, but then uh, they go on and, uh, and, 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 and book a hotel on the hotel channel uh, and, and, and pay less. And therefore there is a showrooming problem. So uh, here the paper offers a new theory of harm that was not offered so far. And uh, it says that uh, under MFNs, uh, platforms prefer to facilitate uh, sellers collusion. This is kind of surprising because uh, normally we think that the platforms like sellers to compete because it increases the volume of transactions. But here actually uh, platforms like sellers to collude and charge high prices. And moreover, uh, MFNs allow sellers to uh, collude uh, more effectively. So, uh, so, you know, both considerations, you know, platforms have an incentive to promote collusion and uh, MFNs also uh, facilitate collusion. So, you know, uh, one, con one concern about MFNs uh, after seeing this paper is that you know, they might facilitate collusion. And I guess uh, the thing, the key issue here to notice is why exactly MFNs uh, make uh, sellers uh, like collusion? Uh, you know, what, and, and again, the, 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 the explanation here is, is, is a little bit subtle. And I guess this is the key th thing to note uh, when, when, when you listen to this paper and, uh, and you know, exactly what is the mechanism by which they facilitate collusion. And, uh, and the last paper uh, by we, Liu and Chan asks the question, uh, can platforms promote quality of uh, seller services by inducing only some sellers to improve quality? In other words, the question is, if, if, if a platform likes sellers to provide high quality, should it incentivize all sellers on the platform? And the main insight here, this is an empirical paper based on, on data from eBay, is that in fact, uh, a platform can only incentivize a fraction of all sellers and uh, other sellers who did not get any incentives will also have an incentive to adopt uh, the higher quality. The higher quality here is premium service, uh, faster delivery, longer return uh, periods. And I guess uh, the, 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 the insight here is that, you know, for a platform to, to incentivize sellers, you don't have to go after all sellers. It's enough that you incentivize only some. And so this is because there is a spillover. Um, and they also find that the spillover is larger when more sellers get incentives. And uh, I guess uh, to me, it suggests that there might be some strategic complementarity in the adoption of quality. If, uh, if a rival of yours provides better service, you have to provide better service as well. Otherwise, buyers will not buy from you. And I guess uh, one, you know, the, the key issues uh, to keep in mind, at least in my mind, is uh, you know, we already know that uh, platforms uh, use seeding. In other words, they, they give uh, incentives to some customers and then somehow these incentives propagate throughout the system. And, uh, and here it's kind of seeding on the supplier side rather than the buyer side. So I guess you know, it would be interesting to know what are the relationships between the two. And uh, also one thing that comes to mind is uh, input output framework where you where where if you if you if you have a complete network it's enough that you touch only parts of the network and then things propagate throughout the network on their own and uh, i guess uh, another question is how effective the mechanism is they show that this exists but the question is you know how exact how, how effective it is and uh, and uh, okay so I guess uh, we have uh, very interesting six papers to listen to that uh, advance the literature on platform competition. And uh, I'm looking forward to the, to the presentations. Okay, so thank you so much, Yossi, for this great introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to give the floor to the speakers. Um, so, um, so, so I would just like to remind people to send the questions by chat. So each speaker has eight minutes and after each speaker will have time for a couple of questions. So if you'd like to send the question by chat to me or to everyone, uh, I can read it loudly. And, and so that uh, we can engage in some discussion. Uh, okay, good. So, so the, the, the first paper of the session will be presented by Matthew 
Bacchus from Colombia, joint work with Tom, Thomas Blake, uh, Jet Petrus, and Stephen Tadellis. So uh, I'd like to give the word to, to, to Matthew. Great. Are my slides showing? Everybody can hear me? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Yossi for that introduction, Renato for running this, the, the organizers for this opportunity to share the work, and my excellent co-authors, Tom Jett and Steve. Uh, this is a paper that, uh, as Yossi said, will examine uh, the effects of a, the availability of a communication technology on the likelihood uh, that parties to a negotiation successfully transact. And I'll spend just a moment trying to, to motivate why we're interested in that question. There's a, a lofty argument that as economists, we should care about bargaining protocols and how they affect the likelihood of success, whether in uh, an online platform like the one we study, peace negotiations, climate change mitigation. And here I've given some examples of bargaining technologies that you could think of as ways of moderating communication in the bargaining process. Uh, that's quite lofty, of course, uh, and fodder for an introduction. So perhaps the more direct case for why we should care about this is related to, to our actual empirical setting um, that platforms that are managing buyers and sellers have to make decisions about whether to allow buyers and sellers who are negotiating to communicate. And here I've listed some examples of platforms, Saatchi Art, Taobao, eBay, Amazon would be another, that have explicit bargaining protocols on which billions of dollars are transacted every year that are making different decisions about how much communication to allow and in what form. The main contribution of the paper though, excuse me, uh, is that you know while there's been a lot of theoretical and experimental work on this question, uh, there's been essentially no introduction of evidence from real life bargaining in the field. Uh, and so this is gonna be the first point of evidence. Uh, we're gonna use data uh, from eBay's best offer platform and we have a natural experiment in the, in the rollout of the messaging feature. There are two main results. One, that there's an economically and statistically, statistically significant positive effect of communication on bargaining success. And two, inspired by some of the findings digging into that first, we show that there are dynamics that you could interpret as evidence of learning, that sellers are learning how to use, repeat users are learning how to use the communication feature. All right, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the best offer bargaining environment. We've done a lot of work on this, typically on eBay.com. Uh, so here's an example where I've done a search on eBay.com for Jean-Michel Basquiat. I found a painting that I like, the one in the middle. So these are search results. If I click on the listing in the middle, then I will go to the view item page where I have two, where I see more information about the item, uh, but I also have two uh, options for purchasing it. One would be to add it to my cart and check out later or to buy it now, in which case I'll pay $4,425 or because the seller has enabled a free feature called best offer, an extra button appears and it's right here under add to cart, it's make an offer. If you click on that, then what you'll get is the pop-up at the top in this slide. It prompts you to offer a numerical amount for the seller. And if you send that offer, they will have 48 hours to accept, reject, or counter. If they counter, you will have 48 hours to accept, reject, or counter, and so on, in a manner that looks a lot like Rubenstein Stahl alternating sequential offers bargaining. We're not going to be working on eBay.com for this paper, though. We're going to be going to the German version of the website, which is a functionally separate website with a little bit of an idiosyncratic history. What I want to call your attention to is the difference in the make offer pop ups on the two sites. On the one hand, one's written in German, but on the other, there's a missing feature on the German version, which I've highlighted in the red rectangle on the bottom, there is no option on the eBay.de website to add a message to seller. These messages on the US website are limited to 250 characters and they can accompany any offer. This was the case at least until 2016, when on May 23rd, eBay.de turned on the communication option. Now there's not a lot happening on eBay, uh, eBay.de at the time. Most importantly, there are no other major site changes, no other confounds that were rolled out simultaneously. Also important, the website was updated. So desktop users are gonna be treated in the post period, but the mobile app was not. And during this period, about 50% of eBay.de users were using the mobile app. What's also the case is that adoption was almost, almost instantaneous and about 6% of bargaining interactions in the post period involving a buyer using a desktop involved a message on this feature. Okay, so it was a low compliance rate, but it very quickly jumped to that level. 
Now, since this is a brief presentation, I'm gonna jump right in and show you the headline table of the paper, which is here. I'll skip columns one through four, which are the pre-post estimates and focus on the diff and diff in columns five and six first. The dependent variable here is whether a bargaining interaction, namely a buyer item pair, successfully ends in a transaction. We're regressing this on dummies for post and desktop, and in the diff and diff, the coefficient of interest will be on the interaction between being in the post period and being a desktop user. What we find is about a half a percentage, 0.4% point effect on the likelihood of successful transaction. Now note, that's an intent to treat estimate. In other words, it's 0.4% for the entire platform. So when you're evaluating this for economic significance, what we'd really like to know is the more interpretable intent, sorry, treatment effect on the treated. In other words, for people who actually use this feature, what was the effect on the likelihood that they interact? And so the common trick to get at this is to convert our diff and diff estimator to an instrumental variables estimator by using the post desktop dummy as an instrument for whether you sent a message in the post period as a desktop user. And that's what we're doing in columns seven and eight. And so what that allows us to do is say that we see between a seven and eight percentage point effect for the subset of users, remember it was only about 6% of bargaining interactions for the subset who actually take advantage of the feature. So we think of this as being economically and statistically significant. What I'm gonna show you next is just another version of that diff and diff regression, which does weak specific effects. Now this is often done in the applied micro literature to ask whether the effect precedes the cause. In other words, whether we get significant effects before the introduction of the change and we do not. But what's more interesting in this figure is that in the post period, the effect doesn't take off instantaneously. It takes a few weeks to kick in and then it stabilizes around 0.4%. And that's what we wanted to dig into next. We're actually gonna use the text of the messages that people are sending to try to understand what's happening in the dynamics of that effect. I don't have time to cover this whole slide, but I promise it's pretty standard in the text analysis literature. We're gonna take all the messages that are sent in a particular week, convert them into vector space by literally counting how often a particular word appears. That's called a bag of words approach. Then we can use cosine distance, since we're in a vector space, to measure how much the language that people are using is changing. That gets represented in these two heat maps, which are telling you about the cosine distance between the set of words that are used in, say, week one versus week eight. And the first thing to notice is that we get nothing in particular on the buyer side, but on the seller side, it seems like there are some interesting patterns here, which turns out to make sense because the modal buyer shows up once and then leaves the platform. There's no room for learning, but the modal seller is a repeat user. Now these heat maps are pretty hard to interpret. So here is the slide where I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit more work, but these are an attempt to try to make the heat maps easier to approach. In panels A and B, we're gonna look at the bottom gradient of the heat map, which is comparing the week indicated on the X axis to week 10 and asking how different they are. Again, for buyers, we see noise and let's focus for now on the solid line, but for sellers, we see a slow descent which corresponds to the idea that what people are saying from week to week is changing and getting closer and closer to what they're saying in week 10. What the different lines are doing is conditioning on sellers who actually send more messages during the 10 week period. So if we condition on sellers who send more than six messages, we see a much steeper descent suggesting that what they're doing is changing even more. So the first thing we've learned is that these patterns are related to repeat users, both in the difference between buyers and sellers and the difference between low repeat sellers and high repeat sellers. So the next thing we wanted to dive into is to ask if this is learning, then we should see that convex pattern that's the signature of learning and information models. Does the rate of change slow down as time passes? For that, we plot the off diagonals of that heat map. That's telling us about the rate of change. Again, for buyers, we see noise, but for sellers, we see that the rate of change is slowing down over any level of difference. And here it's the one period difference, two period difference, three period difference, and so on. So we take this to suggest that we're seeing the convex pattern that we would take as a signature of learning the final result I wanna show you is sort of the cherry on top. If you thought that they were learning, one would hope that they were learning something that would be correlated with success. 
And so what we're gonna do is look at outcomes for these messages. So this is a regression at the message level that regresses a dummy for whether an offer is accepted on the similarity of that message to the corpus of week 10 messages. In other words, what we're converging to. And across a bunch of different specifications, controlling for message length, controlling for seller fixed effects, we get a positive effect. Note that we lose statistical significance when we control for seller fixed effects. There's just a lot of them. What's also neat here though, not only does this suggest that if you say things that make you look more like an experienced user, you're more likely to transact, we also see that the sizes of the effects are comparable to the size of the effect that we saw for the treatment effect on the treated, which was between seven and 8%. Okay, I think that's about all I have time for. So let me go ahead and wrap up. Uh, we asked whether communication facilitates successful bargaining. We found that it does, that it has a large effect. And we also were interested in sort of this aspect of identifying learning behavior um, in, this, in this communication equilibrium. Of course, our paper raises more questions than it answers. What are bargainers saying that affects outcomes? What are the mechanisms? What's the best communication protocol? We do reflect on these problems. We have some descriptive evidence in the, uh, in the appendix. We can talk a little bit about more, more experienced sellers are saying. Um, but this evidence is entirely descriptive. We don't have causal variation that would allow us to identify that. So we hope that there will be more work on these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew, for this, this great talk. Um, I, I, I would have liked to have questions now, but, but since we're out of time, uh, I, I would like to postpone questions on, on, on Matthew's presentation for the end to make sure we don't, we don't explode the time. Uh, uh, so, so now I'd like to, I, I'd like to give the, the floor to Do Xinjiang, who's going to uh, present joint work with Patrick Ré. And uh, again, you have eight minutes and, and uh, questions. If anyone wants to ask questions, please, please do it by the chat. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. So um, I'm very happy to present this joint paper with uh, Patrick Ray. Uh, the paper is uh, yet very uh, preliminary. Uh, this is about uh, App Store. Uh, I cannot, okay. So um, <clears throat> the 30% commission uh, charged by uh, Apple's App Store and Google's uh, Play Store has received large attention uh, both from media and policymakers. And one argument uh, against the high commission uh, might consist in a negative impact on innovation. And a possible defense of Apple and Google may consist in arguing that um, competition between uh, iPhones and Android phones induce them uh, to promote uh, app development. So here uh, we study how uh, competition between two smartphone platforms affects their app store commissions and thereby uh, app development. Uh, we consider uh, two scenarios uh, for comparison. So uh, app store competition uh, can be done in terms of ad value rates, or it can be done uh, in terms of wholesale prices. And if we consider as a benchmark of the static uh, situation in which there is a given number of apps already developed, then as a Bellerin rates generate more efficient outcome uh, than wholesale prices because uh, on the ad Bellerin rates, there is no uh, double marginalization. However, if you look at the main uh, scenario uh, uh, of dynamic situation in which uh, there should be endogenous uh, development of apps, then the result is reversed and ad value rates generate innovation chalk up, um, meaning that there is no app developed, while wholesale price generates some positive amount of innovation. Uh, our model of a mobile flat platform uh, competition is such that uh, each mobile platform is vertically integrated, meaning that they sell uh, smartphones. Also, they operate uh, uh, their own uh, app stores. So there is competition on both sides, uh, on the consumer side by choosing price of smartphones, and on the app side by choosing uh, app store tariffs. 
And we assume consumers, single home uh, developers, uh, multi-home, and we use hoteling model for the device market. So the timing is that uh, first uh, they compete on the app side. So it's platform uh, choose the, the tariff of its uh, app store. And then uh, innovation decision of uh, uh, each app developer is done. And, and, and then uh, the competition on the consumer side uh, unfolds. So uh, if you consider a uh, static situation, <clears throat> so uh, let's look first uh, what happens if a platform choose wholesale price. And then uh, an app developer's profit is given by this where P minus WI is the uh, profit margin. So here uh, app developer is going to choose uh, monopoly price based on uh, marginal cost uh, WI. But uh, if a platform choose uh, uh, add value and rate, then the profit of an app developer is given like this. So uh, as long as this one minus A is positive, the uh, app price chosen will be just the monopoly price based on zero marginal cost. So there is a uh, no double marginalization. And on top, uh, this uh, uh, monopoly uh, price does not depend on AI. So uh, we can conclude that in a static situation, at the rates uh, uh, generates a lower price than any positive wholesale price. Now, uh, in general, uh, the tariff chosen by an app store uh, determines the pi and its division. By the pi, we mean uh, the welfare generated by an app expected the welfare generated by an app uh, per consumer. And so this circle is the pie, and this pie is divided into consumer surplus, platform revenue, and developed profit. Of course, all this division is done by the choice of a tariff, wholesale price, or uh, at a value rate. Now, uh, if we so compute and solve for uh, everything uh, up to the first uh, stage, where each firm uh, choose uh, its uh, app store's uh, tariff, we have this uh, expression uh, for its platform's profit, where T is uh, the, trans uh, the transportation cost parameter, and Y is the number of apps. So given number of apps, uh, essentially uh, each firm is competing uh, in terms of the sum of a consumer surplus, and this is platform revenue uh, per app. Okay, so uh, if we consider the benchmark, the static situation where there is a given number of apps already developed, then its platform just maximize uh, the sum of consumer sur surplus and platform revenue. And this leads to a uh, choose at the value rate equal to maximum equal to one if uh, competition on app store occurs uh, in terms of at the value rates. But if they compete in wholesale price, they choose some uh, positive wholesale price, but, but not that extreme. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so in static situation, since there is no double margination on the added value rates, welfare is higher with the added value rates than uh, on the wholesale prices. So now let me give you the intuition about uh, why uh, A equal to equal to one and the added value rates, because uh, the price is constant, it does not depend on at the zero rate. It means that the pi is constant, uh, even if a uh, platform increases its at the zero rate. On top, consumer surplus is also con constant. Since uh, the platform uh, maximizes the sum of platform revenue and consumer surplus by increasing AI, the platform can increase platform revenue and uh, reduce develop, develop profit. And uh, this is why each platform ends up choosing A equal to one. But uh, things are different if they compete in wholesale price because increasing wholesale uh, price exacerbates the double marginalization. So the pie is the smaller, consumer surplus is smaller. So the platform uh, does not want to charge excessively high uh, uh, wholesale price. So finally, uh, what happens in the dynamic situation where uh, apps must be endogenously developed? Then uh, actually we can show that there is a unique equilibrium which is symmetric and this, so uh, each platform still maximize the same objective. But the reason is that uh, in symmetric equilibrium, you get the faster condition, 
uh, the effect through endogenous Y in, in the first order condition uh, is, uh, disappears because the symmetric equilibrium this term is uh, zero. So that means that uh, still H firm should the same uh, uh, tariffs for F source, implying that on the other value rates, uh, there is innovation chalk off. So now uh, add volume rates uh, generate uh, lower uh, welfare than wholesale price. So uh, let me conclude. Um, um, competition does not provide uh, adequate incentive to promote app development because of a multi-homing uh, of apps. So, uh, so in the future, we want to uh, uh, extend the, the analysis, for instance, by considering uh, platform specific uh, adaptation cost. Uh, Etc. So thank you very much for for your attention. So, thank you so much, Lushi, for, for the the great talk. Uh, I believe we have time for for one question. So if, if we do not have a question so far, we can have them at the end. That's that's equally fine. Um, so 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 now let's move to to the third presentation. Uh, the speaker is Meng Liu from Washington University. He's going to present joint work with Xiang Hui and Ta Chan from Washington University as well. So uh, uh, Meng Liu, the floor is yours. Thank you. You have eight minutes. Hi, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Meng Liu and uh, I first want to thank the conference organizers for including our paper into the uh, wonderful conference program. Also want to uh, thank UC for this wonderful introduction, uh, given that our paper is still early stage. So it certainly would benefit the um, comments on particularly on the framing of the paper. So. Um, this is, is a joint work with um, um, Xiang Hui, I believe he is in the audience, and also uh, Tat Chen. So we are with the marketing group at Washington University in St. Louis. So motivation of the paper. Uh, monetary incentives are commonly used by uh, platform designers to nudge seller effort in certain ways. For example, Amazon gives a 75% discount in storage fees to sellers who store their popular products in uh, Amazon's warehouses in order to uh, you know, uh, uh, um, improve the uh, delivery and uh, inventory process. But giving monetary incentives to all sellers on the platform can be costly for uh, platforms. So sometimes platforms may want to offer incentives to only a subset of sellers, and we call this practice targeted incentives. So in this paper, we are gonna study whether targeted incentive works as well as the underlying mechanisms. So our study leverages a policy change on eBay in, uh, back in 2012, uh, when eBay offered a monetary incentive to enhance seller quality on shipping and return services. For example, uh, specifically sellers who offer a uh, generous return period for their customers and uh, a uh, fast handling of their products uh, would be eligible to receive an additional 5% discount of the commission fees. Uh, so what we uh, we call this practice, uh, this uh, promoted behavior premium service or PS. One key feature of this policy is that the incentive is targeted to only eBay top rated sellers or ETRS, who are certified sellers on eBay who pass a, you know, pre-specified quality threshold. So they are considered of higher quality in the eyes of consumers. So this incentive, the nature of the incentive is that, is that it, it is conditional on the status of the seller as well as the seller's behavior. So here we plot seller's quality provision in the 12 weeks before and 12 weeks after the policy change separately for the targeted and non-targeted sellers. First, we see that the share of PS listings or the quality provision is consistently higher for targeted sellers than for non-targeted sellers 
uh, even before the implement, uh, implementation of the incentive. And this is consistent with the fact that targeted sellers are platform certified sellers who are higher quality sellers to begin with. And secondly, we find that immediately after the policy change, both targeted and non-targeted sellers increase their quality provision. The fact that non-targeted sellers also are more likely to exert effort after the policy change, uh, even though they are not qualified or not eligible for such, uh, such incentive, uh, and this suggests that the targeted incentive would have some spillover effect. So to understand why, we consider four substitutes uh, from the consumer's perspective, defined by targeted and non-targeted sellers and by high quality uh, versus low quality product. So first we consider the um, two products by targeted sellers. So what the monetary incentive does is essentially uh, reduce the uh, cost of quality provision for high quality uh, products. And this would mean a, an increase of the supply uh, in the high quality market and reduce the supply given that the total supply of targeted sellers in the short run is fixed. This in turn leads to a reduced equilibrium price and increase the equilibrium quantity on, uh, for the high quality product and also uh, an increase the price and reduce the equilibrium quantity for low quality products of targeted sellers. So the theory seems to be pretty clear. But how do we empirically test this prediction then? Well, just by looking at these graphs, it'd be great if we have uh, you know, many replicas of the market with different treatment intensities that basically shift the um, uh, supply curves differently so that we can track the changes in the equilibrium notions and see if they are consistent with predictions. And luckily, we have that kind of uh, variation in the data. Specifically, we leverage the large number of product markets on eBay. And these product markets, for example, cell phones and smartphones or toys would be standalone markets. These markets vary in the ex ante share of ETRS sellers or target sellers. A market with more ETRS sellers to begin with would be more treated than a market with fewer ETRS sellers. So essentially, our identification is a continuous DID that compares the temporal changes in outcomes across markets with different shares of targeted sellers. And we indeed find evidence that the supply and equilibrium quantity increase for high quality products of, high, uh, of targeted sellers in more affected markets. Although the, um, the coefficients are not very significant, uh, significantly uh, estimated, but we do uh, find a strong evidence that the supply and equilibrium quantity uh, uh, is reduced for the uh, low quality products and um, the um, equilibrium prices increases for the low quality products of um, targeted sellers. But how does this affect non-targeted sellers then? Well, in the eyes of consumers, the targeted sellers are platform certified sellers who command, who can command higher prices for their products. In other words, they are, should be the sellers up in the um, quality spectrum. Given this, it is plausible, although the theory can go both ways, but it is plausible that high quality products of non-targeted sellers are more substitutable to the products on the right than to the products on the left. So if so, then the rising price of the target seller's low quality product, which is the product on the right, would make consumers substitute toward high quality products by non-targeted sellers, okay? Uh, which uh, moves the demand curve outward. And this in turn leads to a, you know, uh, 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 an increase the supply uh, given that sellers anticipate and increase the demand. And this in turn leads to a reduced supply of low quality products uh, from non-target sellers, given the fixed total supply of non-target sellers in the short run. So to confirm the rising demand in, um, in, in the high quality non-target uh, sellers market, uh, we studied the PS premium, which is the difference in sales probability between identical products that only differ in PS. So this requires that we match the listings in several key aspects to control for a product, seller, and market level heterogeneity so that they are otherwise, otherwise identical except for PS. 
So I don't have enough time to go into details, but let me tell you that we find a strong evidence that consumers do value uh, high quality products from non-targeted sellers. And that uh, this valuation actually um, uh, 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 is increased after the uh, implementation of this monetary incentive. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is uh, that we run the main DID specification separately for the high and the low quality products by non-targeted sellers. And we find a strong evidence that non-targeted sellers reallocated their supply from low quality to high quality, given the rising uh, demand for high quality products from consumers. So uh, let me conclude. Uh, in this paper, we study the effects of a targeted incentive. We find that besides the targeted sellers, uh, non-target sellers are also more likely to adopt the promoted behavior and increase their quality provision. And the reason for that is that non-target sellers experience a larger demand expansion, which motivates them to enhance their quality. And therefore, the overall quality provision on the platform can be uh, increased as an equilibrium result. So this is all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Meng Liu. Um, I didn't get any questions so far. Um, so, so, so in the absence of questions, I, I, I imagine people are leaving them to the end. Uh, uh, so, so we have to, we might move to, to the next talk, which is by Robert Somoji from Budapest and Johannes Honen. Uh, uh, Robert? Yes, so while I'm sharing my slide, let me thank the organizers for this opportunity and also Yossi for all the comments and questions we have uh, already exchanged. So uh, I will talk about deceptive products on platforms, joint work with Johannes Jonan. So many products sold on platforms include additional fees. Um, examples are flight companies and websites like Skyscanner, Google Flights, your favorite, and luggage fees. Price companies on websites like eBay and Amazon and shipping fees, um, even ticket platforms like StubHub and Ticketmaster and service fees. And um, any of these fees um, are obfuscated, uh, not very clearly presented on platforms. And all around the world, uh, policymakers have been increasingly active, regulate, investigating, and sometimes regulating um, these uh, hidden additional fees. Um, like, like one example I like is uh, the EU has recently pressured Airbnb into uh, uh, displaying cleaning fees upfront. And cleaning fees are fees that we will call salary fees that goes to the hosts, not even to Airbnb, and still and Airbnb seem to try to shroud it uh, by showing it only later in the um, booking process. It's also called reprice. So a first question is why do platforms obfuscate fees that they do not even earn themselves? And uh, more generally, uh, we have, I think, a good reason to, to believe that when it comes to additional fees, uh, large online platforms are private rule makers because they can decide whether to shroud or unshroud, either reveal these additional fees. So they would be in a good position to induce transparency if they wanted to, Sometimes they don't want to, and our more general research question is, what are platforms' incentives to create a transparent marketplace? So um, I will only have time to flash the key ingredients uh, of our model. The first one is that by now we have solid empirical evidence that on many markets, at least part of the consumers um, seem to um, ignore or forget about additional fees whenever, uh, whenever they are hidden. And so we will um, build on Gabe and Leibson's seminal paper uh, when modeling naivete. Um, so sellers choose a base price, which is observable to everyone, and an additional fee, which is not. So part of the consumers will be naive, um, who just forget about the additional fees whenever they are hidden. They falsely believe them to be zero, and the other consumers are sophisticated who can uh, anticipate these fees and avoid them by a costly effort. The second main ingredient of the model is that the sellers compete on two-sided platforms, um, um, and uh, so 
we have a monopoly platform in the baseline model. Um, we use a simplified uh, version of Armstrong uh, seminal model. And um, so importantly, the, the positive cross-group externalities are endogenous in our model. They come from the interaction of sellers and buyers, uh, and they are affected by shrouding. And third, I um, think uh, we have good reasons to believe that it is uh, the platform's design choice, whether they want to hide or reveal the additional fees. And uh, we will distinguish two types of additional fees, seller fees and, 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 and platform fees. Seller fees are like the cleaning fee I mentioned that the seller set and the sellers burn, whereas platform fees are fees that the platform set and earn. But in both cases, uh, we believe it is a real realistic assumption that it is the platforms who choose to shroud or unshroud them. And um, so, um, it is the interaction of naivete and two-sidedness that creates a novel mechanism, uh, which in turn creates novel insights in our, in our paper. Um, so the main finding is uh, that platforms have quite strong incentives to, to hide additional fees. And I will very quickly show you two results that support this statement. Uh, the first result comes from um, comparing um, our model where the platforms uh, decide about shrouding and unshrouding um, with a benchmark model where uh, platforms let the sellers decide whether to shroud or unshroud. This is similar to an unintermediated uh, interaction between sellers and buyers. And what we find is that it is actually the platforms who have stronger incentives to shroud seller fees than sellers themselves, which is well surprising at first sight because it is the sellers who earn the additional fees. Um, and very quickly, the intuition is that if you start from a situation where um, on a laissez-faire platform, all sellers shroud, if one seller uh, unilaterally deviates to, and, and unshrouds, reveals the additional fees, then it will attract buyers by being transparent, but it will reduce overall demand because some people will realize that the product is more expensive than what they thought. And because of the cross-group network effects, the platforms will actually suffer more from a reduction in overall demand than the sellers. So what happens is basically platforms coordinate shrouding because they want to prevent sellers from competing in uh, transparency because they want to avoid a loss, loss of demand. So from a regulatory perspective, this result suggests that uh, the existence of platforms may, may worsen non-transparency in addition. Um, we believe that uh, our results nicely connect to empirical evidence. Uh, there is a recent working paper uh, that uh, describes a field or well, conducts a field experiment uh, on StopHub, which is an even ticket platform. And we chose that shrouding a 15% additional fee, which is a service fee, actually boosted revenues by 21%. So I think the order of magnitude is quite, quite remarkable. We have indirect evidence that online platforms shroud a lot uh, because they used repricing a lot, which is a form of, of shrouding. And there is one piece of direct evidence from a 2012 report uh, for the EU Commission that found that two years after the introduction of an all include of, of the all inclusive upfront pricing rule for airlines, uh, almost the share of online platforms who violated this rule was almost twice as high as the share of airlines who violated this rule. So in this case, platforms really seem to shroud more than sellers. And um, our second main result um, uh, relates to platform fees. So these are the fees like ser uh, service fees that the platform sets and collects. And we find that uh, the fiercer the competition among sellers on the platform, the stronger incentive this platform has to shroud its own fees. Um, so we see this as a, as, as a novel adverse effect so platforms have strong incentives to buy their own fees exactly because they induce a competitive marketplace, uh, which is also in contrast with the common argument that online marketplaces always facilitate uh, product comparison. Um, so from a regulatory perspective, um, I, think, I think Frank uh, will talk about um, uh, 
a model and a possible intervention that intensifies competition among sellers on a platform. So if you are to, um, if regulators are to introduce such, a, such an intervention, our model suggests that they should not forget about additional fees either because that could backfire. So to conclude, um, in this paper, we explore platforms incentives to design a transparent marketplace. Uh, we have two results that both indicate that they have quite low incentives to do that. Uh, we believe that this nicely connects to uh, evidence on drip pricing. And um, uh, finally, I would just like to mention that um, I think we have quite a few applications, both avoidable and unavoidable fees, drip pricing. And although in the baseline, I, I told you about it's a monopoly model, we have one extension about, we have many extensions. One of them is about competition between platforms that might, might not help with transparency either. So this is it and thanks. Thank you so much, Robert, for this great talk. Uh, so we do have a few questions on, on the chat. So Alexandre de Poignier is asking, uh, does the result that platform have an incentive to have an incentive to shroud depend on whether they charge sellers and buyers? Um, yes, yeah, so, so in our model, um, they are allowed to charge uh, both sellers and buyers, uh, like in the Armstrong model, you know, the membership fees. Um, and um, um, in, some of, in some of the parameter regions, the membership fees for buyers endogenously become zero, which is quite realistic in, in online markets. So buyers don't have to pay to use the platforms, uh, but they could, uh, they could charge them. Yeah, no, my question was, thanks. My question was about, uh, and I think this clarifies it. Uh, the intuition would be that if you can extract surplus from buyers, then you might want to actually improve transparency, maximize competition, but you're saying that that's not the case. That, that's, your effect won't be killed if you can charge. Yeah, okay. this, this is not what, um, this is not, there is this effect, but there is this additional effect coming from the two-sidedness of the market. Right. You want to attract, actually, so you want to shroud or unshroud based on whichever leads to a higher buyer surplus, because that, even if uh, the price is zero for buyers, by the two-sidedness, uh, you can extract more money from the seller side. So this is exactly the core, core mechanism we have, but we didn't have time to talk about that. Thanks for the question. And uh, there is a, sh a second short question. Lu Xin is, is wondering that the platforms, they have no reputational concern in your model. Yes, I so. see. Yes, I, um, this, is, this, is a, this is a good point. We have, we have talked about it, actually. So it's true that we, we don't talk about reputation at all. We abstract away from that. But um, when it comes to um, additional fees, it's not really clear if uh, you would blame uh, the platform or you would blame a seller. So, Imagine that you're on a hotel booking platform like booking.com and uh, you arrive to the hotel, you have to pay a resort fee. So will you blame booking.com for not displaying the resort fee or will you blame the hotel, the seller, uh, because they charge the resort fee? So for this reason, we think that reputation concerns are well, of, of second order importance. But this is, this is a good point. Okay. so. Thank you so much, Robert, for the Thanks. great talk and for the discussion. Uh, so we are right on time for the second to last presentation by Ron Berman in joint work with Yuval Hel uh, Helen. Uh, Ron? Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? I can. I can. Excellent. Um, and you can see my slides. Great. So um, thanks for inviting me to present this talk today. My name is Ron Berman at the Wharton School. Uh, this is joint work with Yuval Heller. And today I'm going to speak about why firms often prefer not to correctly measure um, the response of their payoffs to all sort of actions that they take. And we call this uh, solution concept or this result the naive analytics equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So we started uh, basically with motivation, which is kind of empirical observation that a lot of firms uh, use observational data to, to do analysis and they choose 
very, very simple analytics. They just run maybe a linear regression. They just do simple averages. They often do not correct for indigeneity of the variables. They are reluctant to run experiments. They say it's too hard. Um, and there's another uh, set of observations, and this is, comes from literature, but also from popular press that says, firms often overestimate their advertising effectiveness. So they spend a lot of money on advertising, but actually it seems to be not very effective, definitely online. And in some cases, when firms don't correct uh, for the geneity of the variables, they also underestimate price elasticities. Um, this causes them to maybe incorrectly price their products. Um, so we have three research questions. Uh, first of all is why do firms maybe kind of choose or converge to playing kind of this using these naive types of analytics? Um, we are trying to explain the direction of the naivete. Like, do we actually can explain why firms overestimate um, advertising effectiveness and maybe underestimate price elasticities and maybe other phenomena that we observe? And uh, is it beneficial for the firms? And finally, we're gonna ask what happens in equilibrium Do firms uh, over-advertise, under-advertise at too low prices, too high prices, and, and what happens to their payoffs? So this is a theoretical paper. Uh, we have um, actually uh, the model itself is not too complex. I'm gonna explain it fully. There are n players. Uh, each player has a payoff function pi i, depends on two things. There's the action of the firm. You can think about it as setting the price or maybe the advertising budget or something like that. And the demand. And the demand that the firm observes or realizes depends on the actions of all firms in the market. Um, and we assume that the demand is not fully known by the firm. And what do we mean by not fully known? We assume there's a two-stage game. Um, in the first stage, the firm um, doesn't really know exactly uh, how its actions XI affects the payoff. So they hire an analyst. The analyst does something with data. And the goal of the analyst is to estimate the response of demand to the firm's action. And then the firm takes the estimate of the analyst, assumes it's correct, and sets the optimal, let's say, price or advertising based on that. Now, what would firms want to do? Firms would uh, optimally want to solve the, the first order condition as if they knew the correct uh, profit function. And this would depend on three things. There's gonna be the direct effect of their actions on the payoff. And there's gonna be the indirect effect through uh, affecting the demand. And what we're assuming is we're assuming that firms know if I increase the price, what happens to the margin of uh, my profit? Um, or if you know, I sell less product or more product, what happens to my payoffs or my profits? But what we assume the firm doesn't know is a derivative. They don't know exactly how missing advertising affects uh, demand or maybe changing prices affects demand because it also depends what other firms do. It depends on uh, unobservables in the market, et cetera. Instead, they hire this analyst and the analyst can be biased. Uh, the analyst, instead of estimating DQI to DXI, which is what the firms would like the analyst to do, they might have a bias um, and they estimate alpha i times dqi to dxi and the firm takes that as if it is true and solves what we call the bias first order condition and in the bias first order condition uh, the firms choose the action that maximizes their profit as if the estimate from the analyst is correct now you might be asking yourself how can analysts make these mistakes well, actually it's pretty simple so for example, suppose an analyst wants to estimate price elasticity, they tell the employees, you know what, just change the prices a little bit on, on a few days, give a discount and I'll use that in my regressions. Well, if the employees are, let's call it lazy or they choose to give discounts on day with uh, lower demand, you will get this correlation and this will create endogeneity and this will uh, have bias in the analysis. A slightly more sophisticated example, if two competing firms somehow set prices the same way, let's say they give discounts on weekends, you will also have the same issue um, that you will have a bias analysis. But the important part of this model is that the analyst never knows and the firm never knows that what they estimate is inconsistent with the data. Their estimate is always consistent with the data given the data that they have. It's not that they have a misperception of their payoffs. They're actually just incorrectly estimating what's going on because it fits their data. So a solution concept has two parts. Um, there's the equilibrium when the firms set their actual, so let's say they set their prices. We call this an alpha equilibrium. We require two parts out of it. Um, the firms need to be setting the, let's call it the prices or the actions XI to solve their bias first order condition. And also the bias second order condition needs to hold. But the crux kind of of this equilibrium comes from what happens in the first stage and the second stage together 
A naive analytics equilibrium is a set of biases by all firms and actions by all firms, where in the second stage, they pay an alpha equilibrium. But in the first stage, uh, what happens is the asset that they chose maximizes their profit. If they deviate to a different uh, level of bias, they will deviate to a different equilibrium in the second stage that will lower their profits. Let me just, uh, an example, suppose firms play a uh, standard differentiated Bertrand duopoly. So here the demand is gonna be uh, the intercept minus the price times uh, the price sensitivity of consumers to my own price. And also if the other firm increases the price, my demand increases, the profit is gonna be very simple, my price times my demand. We prove in the paper that in this case is gonna be a unique naive analytics equilibrium. All firms, in this case, two firms are gonna underestimate their demand elasticity. This is a game of a strategic complements. This causes them, uh, one firm increases the price, the other one also increases the price because of Bertrand competition. As a result, the profit is also gonna increase and the payoffs are gonna Pareto dominate the ones um, in a Nash equilibrium. So then we wanted to ask ourselves, can we generalize this result? And can we say something about general games with more players? And is there like a pattern that we can find into when would firms under or overestimate their demand sensitivity and what would be the result uh, on profits, et cetera? So because it's a short presentation, I'm just gonna um, on one example, take a look at advertising here. We have a game of advertising with positive externalities and a game of advertising with negative externalities. With positive externalities, the advertising is strategic complements with negative strategic substitutes. What we show is that depending on the externality of one firm on the other, and depending on how my actions affect my own payoffs, so when I increase my advertising, it increases my payoffs. Um, what we will observe is that um, both firms um, will overestimate their demand sensitivity in respect to advertising, which is what we actually observe in reality. This will cause them to over advertise um, with complements, they will make higher payoffs with substitutes, they will make lower payoffs It's if um, the equilibrium is symmetric. Uh, Yossi uh, emailed us uh, before this conference uh, and was kind to show us actually that he has two papers uh, that has actually very, very similar results. The main difference is that uh, in those papers, the firms misperceive their payoff functions while well, in ours they're trying to learn from the data and because uh, they are naive in their analytics, they incorrectly learn um, how their demand responds to actions. So just to conclude, um, what our model allows us to do is explain three seemingly unrelated phenomena. I talked about overestimating price elasticities, sorry, underestimating, overestimating advertising effectiveness. We also show in the paper that this can explain overconfidence when you have teams of people trying to create a joint project. This is very similar in outcomes to the results from the delegation literature, but the mechanism is different. It's not that the firms try to uh, set different uh, payoff functions for employees to do something. Here, they're coordinated, they're trying to learn the truth, they just incorrectly do that. The insights from um, this analysis actually have some empirical implications. When we do counterfactual analysis in structural work, we assume firms know the demand elasticities and they set prices optimally. But here, if they actually converge to uh, almost uh, on purpose misestimating the elasticity, they will set different prices. And we need to think what it means when we do counterfactual analysis. And finally, we also now have kind of this trend of telling firms, um, run more experiments, be more accurate, measure everything more correctly. But actually this paper shows that in this case, their profits are gonna suffer. And actually it's not necessarily better to invest in better analytics. Maybe you wanna uh, remain naive. Um, thank you for listening to the talk. Uh, there's more in the paper. There's more in the short video I presented for, uh, the, for the conference. And I would love to answer any questions um, if you have any. Ron, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, I'd like to postpone questions to the end. Uh, Yossi has a comment on the chat, but uh, I'd like to postpone the questions to the end because, because we, are, we only have five minutes and there is, a, there is a, a last paper to be presented by Frank Schluter. Uh, uh, so, so Frank, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so Great, much. Thank, thank you very much, much Renato. Do you see my, um, can you see my slides? Uh, I do, I do, I, and I hear you. Great. Great. 
Um, so, perfect. Um, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to this uh, very nice conference and also thank you very much to uh, Yossi for, for the introduction. Um, my name is Frank Schlüter, I'm a PhD candidate at the Düsseldorf Institute for Competition Economics and I'm happy to talk about, um, about my paper, Managing Seller Conduct in Online Marketplaces and Platform Most Favored Nation Clauses. In this paper I show that these platform most favored nation clauses can reduce the incentive of a digital platform to ensure strong competition between the online sellers that are active on its marketplace. There is this huge and ongoing concern how digital platforms such as the Amazon Marketplace or Booking.com organize their marketplaces and whether we need stricter regulation for the digital economy. Um, just to give you one example regarding these concerns, European Commissioner Margrethe Vestager notes that there are few gatekeeper platforms that act as private rule makers for the marketplaces that they have created. So platform behavior or the rules that the platform sets have an important influence on the functioning of digital markets and whether such a platform wants to ensure strong competition between the sellers that are active on its marketplace is arguably one of the main prerequisites for consumers to benefit from low and competitive prices when purchasing online. At the same time, we have encountered cartel cases involving online sellers on exactly these digital platforms which suggests that these competitive marketplaces that we might expect are not always provided in these environments. And I want to contribute to this broader debate with a specific focus on platform most favored nation clauses and answer the research question, how do these clauses affect the incentive and ability of a platform to ensure competition between online sellers? Let's consider the example of the hotel market. You can see a hotel that wants to sell rooms to consumers and it can do so via different distribution channels. It can use a platform like booking.com, but it can also sell directly to consumers, for instance, via its own website or different uh, distribution channels that you can see here. And in principle, the hotel is free to charge different prices on all of these distribution channels in order to maximize its profits. But in this environment, platforms like booking.com have imposed these platform most favored nation clauses that are at the core of my paper. And there are contractual restriction not to offer better prices or conditions on another distribution channel than on the platform itself. So if Booking.com imposes such a clause and the hotel charges a price of 100 on Booking.com, it is not allowed to charge a lower price on its own website. And these clauses have attracted substantial antitrust scrutiny and current discussions in Europe regarding the Digital Markets Act also propose prohibiting these clauses altogether. Now, I study this environment in a stylized theoretical model of digital platform markets where there are two sellers and they can reach consumers via two different distribution channels. They can reach consumers via platform, but they can also sell directly to consumers, for instance, via their own website. And the platform uses a so-called agency model, which implies that it receives a commission payment for every intermediated transaction on the platform, and it's the online sellers that sets the final retail. Um, it's easiest to explain the results for the case of per unit commission rates, which is why I focus on this case here in the presentation. But in the paper, I also analyze revenue sharing commission rates. And if you're interested, um, you can have a look at the paper. Now, let's briefly, briefly consider how a platform most favored nation clause affects um, online seller pricing in this situation. Absent these clauses, online sellers can react to the commission payments on the platform by charging a lower price on the direct channel. And this allows them to divert sales to the direct channel where they do not face commission payments and find it more profitable to serve consumers. Now this pricing structure is forbidden by a platform most favored nation clause and induces online sellers in this model to charge uniform prices across distribution channels. I want to use this model to briefly explain the two main results of the paper. The, the first main result is the platform incentive to ensure competition between the sellers and how it's affected by a platform most favored nation clause. Particularly, I show that a platform may prefer a form of non-competitive or monopolistic environment between online sellers if it is allowed to impose a platform most favored nation clause. And for this part, I suppose that online sellers can coordinate on the joint profit maximizing behavior, the monopolistic case, and compare it to the non-cooperative behavior in this situation, the competitive case, if you want so. And I show that absent the platform most favored nation clause, the platform unambiguously prefers sellers to compete. And the main reason for this is that intuitively for a given commission rate, 
the platform wants to have the maximum transaction volume on its marketplace, at least for the case of per unit commission rates, um, which is the case that I focus on. Um, and this is exactly what is achieved by seller competition for the platform. It reduces the prices that online sellers charge and this increases the transaction volume on the platform. And as I said, this is the main reason why seller competition is um, profitable for um, the platform. Now, perhaps surprisingly, this is the result that changes quite fundamentally with the introduction of a platform most favored nation clause. And here I show that the platform may prefer monopolistic seller behavior if it is allowed to, to impose such a clause. And the main reason for this result is that um, with, with these clauses, monopolistic sellers actually accept higher commission rates in equilibrium than competing sellers do. And this increase in the commission rate can render this monopolistic seller behavior the more profitable conduct for the platform than seller competition, despite the negative effect of online seller collusion on the transaction volume that occurs by the platform. Yeah, so let me also briefly talk about the second result that I want to explain, the platform's ability to stabilize collusion between online sellers. And here I show that a platform most favored nation clause gives the platform the ability to stabilize collusion between online sellers and that it also finds it profitable to do so. And this approach is mainly motivated by the Carter cases involving sellers on digital platforms that I've mentioned before. And it is a quite direct mechanism that allows online sellers to sustain this coordination on the joint profit maximizing behavior that I've assumed for the first result. And here the main reason why the platform can stabilize collusion is that it can charge a comparably high commission rate for which colluding sellers are willing to list on the platform, but the participation constraint of competing sellers would be violated and they um, would decide to delist from, um, from the platform and compete rather aggressively on the direct channel alone. So in that sense, competitive profits are rather low in, in such a situation and this stabilizes collusion in the sense that it leads to, um, to a decrease in the critical discount factor, which is necessary to sustain collusion as a subgain perfect equilibrium. Now, let me just briefly note that there is empirical uh, research on these platform most favored nation clauses as well um, that suggests that platform most favored nation clauses indeed affect the listing decisions of online sellers. So this appears to be a relevant um, choice dimensions for online sellers if these clauses are used. Now, let me briefly summarize and I argue that based on these results, that my paper established a novel theory of harm regarding platform most favored nation clauses, linking these clauses to reduced competition on the level of the sellers, and thereby adds to existing concerns regarding these clauses that typically focuses on reduced competition on the platform level. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer your question. Yes, sir. So th thank you so much for the great talk, Frank. Um, so Doshin has a, has a comment. He says, then according to the, to the reviewed preference argument, sellers should prefer the platform MFN. Is it the case? Um, so if for the case of colluding sellers, it is. So if, if the conduct of online sellers is collusion or in this monopolistic setting, platform most favored nation clauses, is clearly profitable for the platform. But if there is competition between online sellers, this participation constraint, which is binding in this case, um, might be very tight for the platform. And this might then be even uh, detrimental for the platform. And this is also part of a, of a recent paper by Johansen Berge, and um, they also, also spelled this out. Did, did you analyze the case of competing platforms and, and how the, uh, how, how the multi-home or single home of consumers affects result? Um, so the industry structure that I consider is one platform and one direct channel. Um, and I don't have a second competing platform. No, I don't, I haven't analyzed this. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so, so I would like to, to, to thank you, Frank. And, and I also thank Yossi for his great introduction and, uh, and all the speakers for this great session. We are five minutes late, so I think that's, that's a good performance. And uh, okay, so, so.
Well, thank you very much and have a good evening.